Welcome back to HANA Basics for Developers. In our previous video, we ended <coughs> having had created our first set of tables and views using core data and services. Now, the issue is that our tables are empty, and that makes it rather difficult to, to uh, continue development. We can't easily test, uh, particularly our views. There's nothing to see if we don't have any data in the underlying tables. So before we move on and start doing more development, we want to see how we can get some data into those tables. Now, of course, if we were connecting to an existing schema or another HDI container, that would already have data in it, um, whether that would be the transactional system itself, like you're connecting to an ERP system or you're on the HANA that, that has the ERP system and, and we could just... Um, uh, connect to that external th that external schema outside of our project and and use those tables in um, say create new calculation views. We'll see how to do that a little bit later, uh, a, a few exercises down the road. Uh, so so don't worry that I know that's a very common use case that many of you have, and we will see how to do that. Um, but this is a different situation. We're creating our own tables from scratch. We maybe don't have the data to load yet. Maybe down the uh, down the way, uh, later in the development process, we'll we'll replicate some data into these tables, or or maybe this is a completely new project and these are transactional tables and they won't get filled with data until the production is uh, until the uh, the development is live in production and users start start using the application. Um, you know, in those situations, we probably want a way to be able to import some some data. And, you know, there's a couple different ways that we could do this. Um, of course, we could go to the Database Explorer. And uh, using functionality in the Database Explorer, we could, you know, if we had uh, data existing, you know, maybe from another system, we could import that data. Uh, in uh, CSV or, or Excel format uh, and, and bring the data into the, uh, our, our tables. Um, that can be useful if we want to do like a one-time load into a development system for, for testing. Um, but it probably isn't also the way we would bring mass data into the system of really migrating data from, uh, from say, another database. There we'd want to look at using replication services or SLT, uh, business objects data services, um, or, or maybe even um, a smart data integration and smart data access. Those are all solutions for ongoing uh, movements uh, of data or large scale migration of data. This would be more, you know, when you're in a development system uh, doing a one-time load or, or something like that. Now, the other option that we have is uh, using the database explorer as well. I could simply go to the uh, uh, go to the table here and say open data and although there isn't any data in the table I could actually use the interface here to start creating data I could insert a new record and I could just type in the data through this through this interface now obviously that can be a little error prone you know I have to make sure that my keys match up it's it's a really manual task and maybe as a developer I don't um, I don't know all the business rules about uh, about the data formats and you know what the allowed values are but it can be useful for stubbing in the data but once again it's kind of a one time thing you know I'd enter the data here you know I could export it uh, you know download it after I enter it and then maybe use it in another system or or uh, you know another container instance of another developer is working but I want to show you a third choice uh, that that is a little I prefer personally because what it allows us to do is put the data as uh, CSV files into our project so then they'll be stored with the design time objects they'll be sent back to git and if any other developer checks out and and builds this container they're going to get that data automatically loaded as well so it's a it's a really good way of stubbing in test data um, that can be shared automatically uh, amongst uh, multiple developers working on a project. Um, the other thing that this can be used for, this uh, table data configuration approach, is you can also use this, I mean, we're talking here about stubbing in test data and, and, uh, and uh, scenarios like that, but a lot of times maybe you want to inject a little bit of 
starter data, bootstrap data, or maybe you have configuration data that's part of your application. And you know, not transactional data, not master data, but just something that controls how your application works. Uh, kind of like rules that you, you don't want to hard code, uh, but, but maybe you just want to set them up so they can be easily changed via, via data in a table. Uh, this can be a great way to deliver this along with your application because this, this data that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add in here would also be deployed into production. You know, that's the thing to keep in mind. Maybe, maybe you only want it in the development system, but, but unless you remove it from the project later, it, it will go through, you know, everywhere that you install this application um, and, and do the build on the database module or deploy the, uh, deploy the whole project, you, you would get this. Um, so what we want to do here is, uh, is we want to create a new folder. Uh, actually, we, we want to create a new file. And I'll show you a little trick here. If you have to create new folders, because we actually want to put this in our source folder, but we want to put it in a subfolder called loads. And, and I could create the folder first manually, but you can actually create folders while you're creating files. This is, this is pretty neat. Uh, so, so what I'm going to do here is I, I'm actually going to come here and I'm going to say, um, I'm just going to use the new file in this case. And, and notice how you can list folders here as well. So I'm going to say loads because I want to put it in a subdirectory under source. And, and I started this off of source, so I know that's, that's already going to be in the, in the path. So I'm going to say loads, and then I'm going to say purchase cds.hdb table data. Now, um, this is important. The file extension is obviously very important because that tells the deployer what type of artifact that we are deploying. Um, and if you make a mistake typing the file extension, um, like if you give it a different artifact name, you know, if I would make a mistake and give it the wrong one, it would obviously, you know, maybe the syntax wouldn't match up. Uh, but more likely, if I made a typo and, and I really like left out a character, um, then I'm going to get an error message that there's no deployable unit found for this artifact. It's basically saying, I don't know what that is. I, I don't know what to turn that into. So you want to be careful if you are typing these file extensions. And for most database artifacts, um, you you do have to type the file extension. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and create this. Um, you do have to create it. You know, do this uh, via the the new menu, new file, because you, you see here there's not a, uh, an option here for everything. There's there's probably I don't I don't know the exact number forty between forty and fifty different database artifacts, and they don't all have menu options on here. There's only the most commonly used ones that that have menu options, uh, and up until the October patch, the October 2018 patch of the Web IDE uh, for SPS03, we had to say new file and just type the file extension and, and hope you didn't make a typo and you had to know the file extensions. Now I will point out, I, I could have used this approach as well. In As of this patch level that I mentioned, we have this new database artifact. And what this does is, is I could still have done the folder and the file name, but I don't have to fight type the file extension, I can choose it from this list box. And, and this way, all the database artifacts are in here. So I've got one place to go to look at what all the possible artifacts are, even the ones that aren't in the right mouse click uh, context menu, obviously. And when I choose them, it's going to put the file extension automatically on there, so I don't have to worry about making a typo. Uh, so just pointing out that that's, that's, that's really a, a nice improvement. I, I, I teach a lot of classroom uh, training, and, and it's very easy for people to, uh, uh, to make typos. It happens, uh, it happens a lot, and, and then that error message is, is um, difficult for people, particularly new to the, to the environment, to figure out what, what it means. All right, uh, so we got this uh, purchase CDS HDB table data. Now, an HDB table data file is is really just like a uh, uh, like a load configuration file. Because what we're going to do here, let me go get the syntax uh, once again, so you don't have to watch me type it. I'm going to go grab it here, ex two three, and I'm going to cut and paste this in, and then I'll tell you what it is that we're doing. So this configuration file basically allows us to say what database table inside our container do we want to target. So I want to load data into the purchase order headers table. 
and uh, then I specify the source. Well, I want to load it from a CSV file, which we're, we're gonna we're gonna create here in a second in our project as well. And you know, and there's some options we can say whether it's CSV or text tab delimited. You know, there's a couple different formats that the importer supports. Whether there's a header column on it. Um, you know, and we can do different configurations. There's even more configurations than what's listed here. You can view them in the online help. And the other thing that we can do is we can set import settings. Uh, we can say which columns we want to import, and then we can map them. So the, the order of the columns in the CSV file don't have to match the order of the columns in our target table. We can, we can move them around. We can skip columns. We can even apply certain formatting rules. Now, this isn't meant to be a whole, you know, data load solution it, 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 it the the mapping capabilities are limited um like i said this is this is a small scale use case for loading a little bit of test data or uh base configuration data bootstrap data there are other more robust solutions if you want to do you know mass data migration and and uh adjustment as, as you bring it in but you know it serves it serves the purpose that we want here for uh, particularly for development testing scenarios and, and then what you see here is we're just going to do the same thing with the items table. I'm going to have a separate CSV file, and then I'm going to load data into it. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and save that file. Uh, now the other thing that we need is we're going to need some CSV uh, with some records. Uh, so let's just go ahead into the same folder. And uh, you know this time I'm going to use this new database artifact. And I'm going to choose CSV. And what I want my file name to be, header CDS. And I've already got the data out here in GitHub. So we'll just cut and paste the data. There's two header records that we're inserting. And then let's do the same thing for item. New. V, and we'll name this item CDS. Let's say create. Go ahead and grab this data. There we are. We have a few more item records. We're going to make sure we get a couple of item records for each of the two header records. Uh, we got some euro data. We got some US dollars. Um, so we got, you know, enough to test a few of the different scenarios that that we know that we're going to need to support in this application down the road. But not a ton of data. It's pretty easy uh, for us to, uh, to troubleshoot with sm such a small amount of data. So I've saved these files. Now, now notice this, my, my database module, it's already been deployed, all right? So I have a runtime version. I can come back over here to the, uh, uh, to the database explorer and I can see that the header and item tables uh, exist. But now that we've added some new artifacts, or if we had changed some artifacts, the system's telling us with this pending deployment, it's telling us, well, these items, you've saved them, and we could have even sent them back to, to Git, but they haven't been deployed into the HANA database. So as, as you do development, you know, maybe it was the end of the day, maybe you went home, and then you came back in the next morning, and you're looking at your project, and you're like, oh, did I deploy that or, or not, you know, and, and sometimes it can be confusing if you went over to the database explorer, maybe you just don't see changes that you expect to see. So this pending deployment flag is actually a, a new feature as well that we added in the, in the October 2018 patch uh, of the Web IDE to help people to, to know which parts of their projects have actually been deployed into the Honor database and, and which ones have not. You know, we see here that our our actual tables and views, they don't have the pending deployment. They haven't been changed, so they're not going to be touched uh, when, I, when I rebuild this, uh, this, this project. Now, the other thing that I could do here is I can always come up and, and build the entire project. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the entire module. And the system will do a delta mechanism. It knows which items have changed, and it's only going to deploy those, those ones that have changed. Um, but I can also come to uh, a certain folder or even a certain item and do a build on it. Now when I do that, when I do that selective build, um, I'm sort of choosing the, the dependencies. Um, and, and the system isn't necessarily going to go grab other files that, that might 
that might be dependent upon. Uh, you know, for instance, if I tell it to just selectively build the CS uh, or uh, the table data, it would actually error out because it needs the CSV files as well. Uh, and you might wonder, well, well, why do that? You know, um, and, and honestly, 99% of the time, you probably just want to go up to the module level, say build there, and let the system figure out uh, what what all needs to be adjusted. It's very efficient at doing that. But once in a while, you get in a situation where maybe one part of your project is done and you want to start testing it, and another part is not finished. Maybe I had uh, a calculation view in another folder, and it's not finished yet. And if I tried to build the entire thing, it would error out. And, and building is an all or nothing. If I get an error in even one artifact, it doesn't deploy any of the, of the changes. It's an all or nothing deployment. And that's where this uh, build selective objects to do a building at just a certain level can be nice in those situations. Uh, so let's imagine I had another folder here and I had a calculation view in it and it wasn't finished yet. Uh, I could come to just this folder. I'll go to the loads folder and I'll say build selective files. And now wherever my mouse cursor is, it's going to use that level and lower and it's going to build. Uh, so this folder, if it had, had subfolders, it would have it would have grabbed those subfolders. Um, but what we see here is it's it's just processing uh, just this one loads folder, uh, just uh, just these couple of files, and, and now it's it's brought them in and it's done a build. Um, it did not drop the tables and and rebuild the tables or or anything like that. Uh, it was just able to load the data into those tables. Now we can go over and verify this. If I come over and um, and I look at the table now, if I do open data, we'll see that yes, we have our two records in the header table. If I come here and look at the item table, we should have our yes, our, our 20 records, 10, 10 items uh, per each of the two headers. Enough data for us to be able to mess around with and and do some testing. Okay. Um, now, if we were to come here to the view and do open data on the view, then we see the combined data uh, of the header and, and the items all together. So we have some of the details from the header combined with, uh, with the item data as well. Uh, so this allows us to test that our, our view works uh, now finally as well. Now, just to uh, reiterate, I, I want to stress, you know, this isn't the only way to load data. It isn't the way to do mass data. And it isn't necessary to do this sort of thing if you are connecting to an existing schema or another container. Uh, and I realize that's probably the majority of your use cases. And we will see how to do that very shortly as well. Uh, but this is a still a useful tool for testing. Um, and during the development process, like I said, especially when multiple developers are working on the same container, you know, once I would push this project back to Git at this point, then all developers would have the same CSV file. And as soon as they build their, uh, their container, uh, they would get that content automatically loaded. So it's not like they have to run scripts or, or manually do anything to, to load this data. That's, that makes this approach very, very convenient.